Well, let me thank all of the students uh, for participating in the essay contest. Thank the parents for driving them here today. Um, this is the 12th year we have done a State of the Union essay contest. Um, and this year, I think we had more essays submitted than ever before. We had uh, some 400 plus essays from 38 high schools around the state. That's a lot. Uh, and in the last, last couple of years, we were unable to meet in person because of COVID. So I'm delighted that we're here today. And this is the first time we have done uh, the, um, the discussions uh, in the Senate chamber. This, as I think all of you know, Vermont has one of the most beautiful state houses uh, in the country. I've seen many state houses. This really is beautiful. And this room is one of my favorite rooms in the whole world. It's really, really nice. I'm delighted that we're able to be here, and I want to thank the legislature for allowing us uh, to use the, uh, the room. Um, so why do we do this contest? And the reason is that we live in a democratic society, which means, unlike an autocracy or a dictatorship, it means that all people have a right to express their views and help shape the direction in which the country goes. And by all people, it doesn't mean that you've got to be 18 or older. Uh, it means all people, including young people as well. And sometimes it is especially important as I think this moment calls for, for young people to be involved, because so many of the important issues facing our country and the world are going to impact the younger generation even more than the older generation. So what we have tried to do over the years is to get young people thinking about the crises, the problems facing the country, and if they were to give the State of the Union address, uh, as the President of the United States does every year, what would they say? You know, if you got up there in front of the Congress, as is the case, and before tens of millions of Americans who watch it on TV, what is the State of the Union? What are the problems that we face? Where should we be going? How do you bring people together? So that's kind of what we've asked young people, and we've had some wonderful, wonderful essays, and uh, we have asked an independent uh, group of Vermont teachers. We at my office had nothing to do with determining who won or not. Uh, just uh, teachers who read all of the essays that came up with their determination, and that's where we are today. So today we have uh, the 10 top winners, which does not mean to say there are some wonderful uh, essayists who are not here, but the top 10, as judged by the teachers, are here, including the top three who are with me right now. Uh, so what we're going to do uh, is, is this. Um, I'm going to ask each of the uh, finalists, the top 10, to speak for two or three minutes. And I want them to speak not just on their essay, I want them to do that, but I also want them to go a little bit broader and to imagine themselves, if you're up there on the podium in the very beautiful House of Representatives in Washington, and you're speaking to the nation, what are the other issues that are going on? Right now, this is a very unusual moment in American and world history. Uh, so many things are going on. But I want you to go into your hearts. Don't tell me what your teachers say, or don't tell me what was on uh, TV yesterday. But what you assess as young people to be the problems facing this country. So, uh, you know, take up to two or three minutes. This is informal. Uh, we'll have a discussion. I want people to comment on what other people say. I'll ask you some hard questions. Uh, I'm going to play devil's advocate, ask you to defend your positions. Uh, so that's it. Uh, so thank you very much. We're just going to go right down. My staff put this in order, so I'll give you the order here. And that is, uh, we're going to start with Sarah, uh, Sasha uh, Land, then we're going to go to Eva Frazier, then we're going to go to Sam Leggett, and they're up here with me, then we'll go to Jackson Bennett, then we're going to go to Penelope uh, Dorset. Then we're going to go to Jocelyn Dunn. Then we're going to go to Samantha uh, Hazelman. Then we'll go to Anna Pringle. Then we'll go to Isabel Tuper. Uh, then we'll go to Luna Wood. And that's it. So with that, let's start off with the young lady who uh, 
uh, got the top award. And I should also mention to you guys uh, that we are going to be publishing all of your essays in the congressional record. And the congressional record is, in a sense, the official record of the United States government, I think going way back when, when the country was first formed. So you're going to be part of American history. You'll be there in the record. And I think we have a special little gift for you uh, after the um, uh, discussions are over. And also, if anyone wants to do a photograph afterwards, we'll do that as well. So with that, let's begin. Uh, Sasha, why don't you take two or three minutes to talk about your essay and, generally speaking, what you perceive to be some of the issues facing the country. Take it away. Hold the mic as close to you can, as you can. Okay. Um, so I did my essay on voting rights and voter suppression, and I think it's an issue that has really been becoming apparent in the past few years, especially around and after the 2020 election. There's been waves of anti-voting legislation that makes it harder for people to vote, that strengthens the ID requirements, restricts mail-in voting, even when many citizens still struggle to get to polls. And most, like this proportionate amount of the negative effects from this legislation also falls on BIPOC communities as well as young voters. And I think it's a very big issue, the fact that so many Americans are, aren't able to vote because of these restrictions that are put in place supposedly to counteract voter fraud even even though it has been proven that it's not nearly as big as an issue that warrants such restrictive measures against vote against voting and people's ability to vote. So I think that what needs to be done is that there needs to be legislation to ensure voting rights to protect people's ability to vote and make sure that voting is an accessible thing that people can do even if they can't get to polling stations or if they're not registered. It should be a lot easier than it already is to vote because it's such an important process in our country and it dictates how the country is run, who runs the country. So I think that there needs to be legislation. I think that voting day should be a national holiday so that people can vote. I think that voting on Sundays should be should be allowed, especially since that's another thing that dispropor disproportionately affects BIPOC communities and restricts them from being able to vote. And and then there's also the issue of incarcerated people or people who aren't able to vote because they have or previously were a f were a felon or still aren't able to vote even after they've served their sentence. So I don't think that this should be a, that people who have already served their sentence in prison should be unable to vote, should be um, unable to have a say in their country. And I think that especially now having being able to have a voice is so important and it's important for people to know that their vote counts as well. So I think that is one of the biggest issues that we're facing right now and probably will be continuing to face in some form as long as the country stands. So. Sasha, thank you very much. Good job. Uh, Eva Frazier at, uh, and I should mention, Sasha's from Brattleboro Union High School. Uh, Eva Frazier's from CVU, Champlain Valley Union High School. Yeah, after seeing the um, rise of waves of anti-abortion laws across the country. Um, I chose to write my essay on reproductive um, health care and the access to reproductive health care. Um, there has been multiple drastic um, barbaric laws in many other states, um, including the cutting of funding to services like Planned Parenthood that provide really crucial health care services outside of abortion services in the country. Um, I feel this is a really pressing issue because it impacts um, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of um, people in America. And um, as the number of states that pass these laws rises, um, fueled by seeing other states do so, 
um, we will see a drastic rise in the number of women who die of unsafe abortions, who are not able to get the reproductive health care that they are entitled to as their own bodily human right, um, and an increase in the number of people having unwanted pregnancies that often result in loss of educational opportunities, economic opportunities, um, strain to our um, su public support services, um, et cetera. In addition to reproductive health care, I think some of the other most pressing issues in this country right now are obviously our racial justice. Um, we are seeing lots of inequity in pretty much every level of society from education to incarceration, uh, healthcare access. I think the COVID-19 pandemic has really amplified a lot of the issues currently facing the United States that were able to be masked prior um, with the higher death rates of BIPOC Americans, um, highlighting the lack of equity in our healthcare and support um, services in the United States. Um, also, obviously we have um, foreign affairs, including the war on Ukraine and our relationships with other countries. And I think we need to be a strong defender of human rights across the world, but starting within our own country as we are currently failing hundreds of thousands of people as these abortion laws um, are passed. Um, I would suggest that the United States um, repeals the Hyde Amendment, which um, prohibits government funding, including Medicaid and Medicare, um, to be used on healthcare services, including abortion, in addition to um, passing laws that would enshrine the right to abortion um, at the national Senate level. Um, in, the United States, in Vermont, we are making steps with Prop 5, which would guarantee the right to abortion in Vermont's um, constitution, which would make us the first state to do so, and that will be on the ballot this fall. More states should move towards do that, but we as a national government have a responsibility to our citizens to protect um, bodily autonomy. Okay, Eva, thank you very much. Good job. Uh, Sam Leggett is from Woodstock Union High School. Uh, I chose to write my essay on food insecurity and uh, specifically how it has worsened during the COVID-19 pandemic and more specifically the uh, continued implementation of universal school meals uh, on a federal level following the era of COVID. So um, similar to many other issues that our country faces, uh, food insecurity was only worsened by the pandemic, uh, even in Vermont, it was worsened, and the USDA, uh, as a temporary measure, uh, implemented universal school meals nationwide, uh, so every student has access to uh, free breakfast and free lunch during their school day. And uh, the problem is that right now that's still a temporary measure, and it won't persist after COVID. It will actually end this year unless legis legislation is passed soon. Um, so I was inspired by uh, Senate Bill 100, which is currently uh, going through the Vermont State House. Uh, and Senate Bill 100 is basically legislation that will do exactly this. Uh, uh, starting next year, students will have access to free breakfast during the school day because of this bill. And I think starting in 2020, or 2025, they'll have access to free lunch as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Sam, thank you very much. Okay. Our next essayist is Penelope, Penelope. And by the way, if people feel comfortable when they're talking, they can take their mask off. I think everybody has been tested who's here. Um, if not, keep it on. That's okay. My next uh, speaker is Penelope DeRosit. I hope I got that right. Penelope, did I get it right? Well, I wasn't even close. All right. You were close. All right. Someone once said to me, you know, anyone who's not a man does not explicitly have equal rights in the United States Constitution. And no, in fact, I did not know that. Um, so recently I did some research and I found out that uh, there was an amendment proposed in 1923 called the Equal Rights Amendment, 
which would have explicitly granted equal rights under the law to all genders. But alas, it was not ratified before the time limit. Uh, it has, I think, recently gained the number of states required to ratify it. And um, I think waiving the time limit would be the best option. Because there really is a need for this amendment. Uh, last year uh, was a record year in anti-abortion legislation. And um, women's rights, laws protecting women's rights are consistently um, reduced, restricted, just eroded uh, by legislators and judges. And I think that by providing an explicit constitutional stance against gender discrimination, that would solve a lot of the problems that uh, women and just everyone who's not a man is facing in this country as a result of gender discrimination. Good. Thank you very much. Good job. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Jocelyn Dunn from Essex High School. Jocelyn. Um, I decided to write my essay on um, recent political shifts that have been threatening uh, the future of Roe v. Wade. Um, I think that uh, everyone in this country deserves rights, reproductive rights, and um, access to abortion. And recently, um, the Supreme Court has been uh, looking at cases that are um, directly targeting the directly targeting the um, the precedent set by Roe v. Wade, and um, I in my essay I offered a solution of there should be um, in in the Senate right now pending is a Women's Health Protection Act, and the Women's Health Protection Act would create a um, statutory right for healthcare providers to. Um, provide health care services and then kind of a continuous right for people to receive those services. Um, I think that right now it's imperative that people um, have the right to bodily autonomy um, for their um, mental health and um, yeah <laughs> and uh, I, I think that passing the Women's Health Protection Act um, will provide a solution to the issue. Okay, Jocelyn, thanks very much. Our next speaker is Samantha, hope I'm pronouncing it right, Hazelman uh, at Bellows Free Academy Fairfax. Samantha. Thank you. So I wrote my essay on the opioid crisis. Um, and what inspired me to write my essay on this is because I have a very personal experience um, with this. Samantha, uh, can you speak a little bit yeah, louder, absolutely. please? Yeah, um, absolutely. So I have a very personal experience to this topic. Um, my mom actually has had an addiction since for 12 years now. Um, and because of her addiction, she, I watched her struggle on a daily basis, but also the support and resources that were given to her, they weren't really helping her at all. And um, as I got older and I got more educated about this topic, because I was very passionate about it, um, I realized that there's a lot that could be done and there's a lot that could have really helped her. Um, and just on like a whole wide of this, um, topic, it affects children, it affects families, um, and it causes an emotional and physical economic struggle for all of these um, individuals. And I think that we really need to focus on the resources and focus on the access and make sure they're strengthened because, I mean, to be honest, the system is very, these systems for these individuals are very fragile and they're not really built on a solid foundation. And I feel like we need to be able to make sure the access 
is able to help them, but also um, resources are being able to be accessed and it's affordable for these individuals because no one truly no one chooses to be an addict like no one chooses to lose their children no one chooses to you know be sick all the time so i think that we need to be by these individual sides and be like we're here for you and acknowledge and encourage and just recognize these individuals that have made it through their addiction and are in their recovery and make that known for them. So. Pardon me? Oh, did he? I'm sorry, Jackson. All right, thank you. It's an honor to be here. All right, uh, my essay was on plastic pollution and it's clear that it's a major problem in our society today. Some not so fun facts to put this into context are 6.3 billion tons of plastic waste is being added to landfills daily. And yearly, the amount of plastics in landfills can circle the earth four times. And that plastic doesn't just disappear. Plastic can take between 400 and 1,000 years to degrade. So what can we do about it? I believe that there should be some sort of government-run incentive program to switch to plastic alternatives. These alternatives include bamboo, seaweed, wood, cloth, and for non-biodegradable multi-use substances, we can always use stainless steel and glass. Uh, from one of my sources, EarthEasy, finding alternatives to common items like plastic bottles and plastic packaging is becoming increasingly easier. I have faith that at some point we will make the switch to plastic alternatives, but individuals are unlikely to solve the problem on their own. To that end, I think the government should do something about it. A statewide or nationwide ban might be too harsh without economical cushioning and might negatively impact small businesses. So I propose taxing plastic and using the money gained to invest in plastic alternatives, making the switch economically easier. This should eventually be followed up with a ban. And I did not touch on this point in my essay, but I would like to add that a great first step has been the plastic bag ban, which the majority of Vermonters support. Great. Jackson, That's thank all. you very much. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Anna Pringle at Essex High School. Yeah, so I wrote my essay on mental health. We were right about to do our mental health unit in AP Lang. And I think that people don't prioritize their mental health enough. And I wrote about loneliness from COVID. COVID has had such a huge impact on everyone's mental health of all ages. And I think that we should focus more on it. It affects our daily lives, how we feel, how we act, how we sleep. And in Netherlands, they created this 24 seven loneliness hotline. And they also made these chat registers where in grocery stores, the workers will make small talk with the customers and make them feel like they have friends. And I think that we should, in America, raise more awareness and bring more attention to the mental health topic because I think that's very important. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Isabel Tupper is at Brattleboro Union High School. Isabel. So I chose to write my essay on black mental health and more specifically how the COVID-19 pandemic, the murder of George Floyd and other wrongful deaths since then have affected black people and their mental health. I chose to write about this topic because it's very current and it's, suicide rates are increasing rapidly. And in the last two years, anxiety and depression symptoms have more than tripled and this number just keeps increasing. So therefore we have to pay attention to it if we want that to slow down at all. And I think a lot of people are unaware of how pressing an issue this really is. And I'll admit that before writing this essay, I too was very unaware of the suicide rates increasing and the tragedy that came along with black mental health care and the lack of BIPOC mental health professionals and so I really took this essay as an opportunity not only to educate myself, but to inform other people of the attention that this issue really needs. Uh, moving forward, I believe that black mental health care needs to become a priority by mental health being uh, included in insurance, health insurance, and it needs to be affordable. 
and schools should also hire school-based clinicians, specifically members of the BIPOC community, who can sympathize and empathize with their BIPOC students' experiences so that those people have an outlet to go to and so that they don't feel the need to isolate themselves. And lastly, I think it's really important that everyone in our society has open, honest conversation about this topic so that we can break this stigma and support black people in our lives and all people and prove that mental health is important no matter your race. Okay, thank you very much, Isabel. Uh, I think our last speaker is... Luna is not here to join us today. Uh, Luna, Luna is not here, okay then. Okay. okay. Uh, let me thank all of the uh, speakers for doing a great job. Uh, and Sasha, uh, no good deed goes unpunished. You're first. So I'm going to ask you the first question. Are you ready? Yes. All right. Um, I want to eliminate, I'm playing a devil's advocate here. Uh, I think all of us believe that elections should be done honestly. Um, we want people who are entitled to vote to vote. What's the problem with voter ID? I think that the main problem with voter ID is that it's much too hard to be able to register for one and that many people are turned, I think, sorry, many people are turned down because they don't have a voter ID because of the obstacles that they have to face to get a voter ID. And I think that either it should be able to be easier to get one to be able to register securely or to loosen the requirements altogether in a way that still ensures safety of elections but doesn't require people to jump through so many hoops just to be able to vote. All right, uh, for everybody else, jump in uh, on this discussion. Democracy, the attacks on democracy, is that a serious issue? Um, what is the best recourse? What is the problem with voter ID? Pick up on what Sasha said. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Don't be shy. I will call on people if you don't raise your hand. I'm happy to go. Okay. Adding on to what Sasha said about voter ID, voter ID laws um, really specifically target low-income and BIPOC communities um, who face the most voter disenfranchisement. Um, and I fully agree with Sasha um, in that while voter ID may be a um, good idea when you think about it first, but um, due to like racial policies um, back to our country's founding, voter ID has really just been used as voter suppression. Um, if we change how we do voter ID and make it much more accessible. Um, Vermont, I feel like, has a pretty good job of doing voter registration and we don't require voter ID, um, but many people in other states do not have the same opportunities. So I think Vermont does a good job, but we should move to do that nationally. All right, more discussion on uh, the issue of democracy. Um. Uh, I really liked what Sasha and Eva said, and I also think that there's an issue with, um, which Sasha touched on in their essay, I, there's an issue with um, the ableism uh, of not allowing mail-in voting or um, like early voting, and um, disabled people may not be able to get their voice heard and they're, they're citizens too. It's important for their voices to be heard in this democracy. Okay, in terms of voter ID, I want you to stay on that one for a moment. So what is the problem? I have a Vermont license, driver's license in my pocket. I got ID, so what's your problem? Is it almost the problem? I think that part of this issue arises in the trans community because many people have an ID before the transition that they might not feel identifies with their current identity or gender. 
and oftentimes due to prices or just time, they're unable to get an updated ID that they identify with more. And so if someone looks at that ID and doesn't immediately see the person in the picture as the person standing before them, it prevents them from being able to vote. Okay. All right, let's move. We've got other topics to go into, uh, Eva. Um, give me the other side of the story. You think women should have the right to control their own bodies, right? Yes. You want to see laws passed to that degree, but there are many, many states in the country which are moving in the other direction. Uh, be a spokesperson for the opposition point of view. Um, I feel like um, a great deal of the opposition comes from um, religious beliefs um, and the imposition of religion into politics um, in government, state governments that are heavily dominated by um, specific religious ideologies and religious parties. Um, obviously, our First Amendment protects the right to religion, but um, not the right to force your religion on others. But um, I think that's where a large amount of anti-abortion uh, sentiment comes from, from uh, religious movements that have mobilized specifically around abortion, um, and decreeing, decreeing that as a sin and um, violating people's personal beliefs. All right, let me stay on that theme. You are a legislator from Texas or Mississippi, and you voted for very strict uh, laws regarding abortion. Tell me what you're saying. Who wants to defend that point of view? Or at least tell me what that point of view is. It's important that we know the other side of the story. Jo Jocelyn, you want to do that? All right. Russell, thanks. Uh, okay, Sam, um, I am a taxpayer. Why do I have to worry about people who may be having some financial difficulties? I'm going to worry about my own family. What do I have to worry about other people? Well, when it's uh, in the case of universal school meals, um, this should be a... a no family who is experiencing uh, things that limit them from, uh, or their children from getting uh, nutritious or having access to food. Um, for those parents, it shouldn't, the tax paying burden shouldn't be on them because they already have enough of a burden on themselves. And they, this, the only way to um, achieve this equi equitably would be to uh, spread the burden out among um, everyone so that everyone contributes a little bit and the people who have who need these resources the most aren't hit the hardest with a, a, grit, a big tax hike. Okay. Let me expand on that question and I want others to jump in. Is eliminating hunger or childhood hunger in America a social issue or is it a personal issue? Why don't people take care of themselves, feed their own families? Who wants to jump in on that one? Thoughts? It's a social issue. Um, ch the children of our country are the future of our country and um, their health is important to uh, future decisions being made because if they're not here, they're not healthy, um, then w there's no future of our country. Well, let me expand that question. If making sure that children don't go hungry, right, that's what you're saying, see that as a social issue, where does it end? Should we guarantee health care to all people next? Who wants yes. to jump in on that one? Yes, we should guarantee health care to all people next. Okay, why? Um, because um, the 
the health of the community uh, of all American citizens is important to the country. And um, right now, with healthcare prices as they are, our lowest uh, income communities um, are almost being abandoned by their country. And uh, they should they should feel as though they are valued by the American government as much as the richer and upper class citizens. Okay. Um, let me ask you a question, see if you know the answer. How many major uh, industrialized countries in the world do not guarantee health care to all people? Anyone know the answer to that? Any of you know the answer to that? You go up north, any of you guys been to Canada? What's the story in Canada? Do you think everybody has health care? They do. What about Germany? Do you think everybody has health care? Finland? Norway? Sweden? The UK? Yeah. So the answer is you are living in the only country on earth, major country on earth, that does not guarantee health care to all people. Uh, we spend far more per person on health care than any other country. We've got over 85 million people who are either uninsured or underinsured. But all of that raises a very broad philosophical and political issue, which is at the heart of a lot of what goes on in Washington. People think, oh, why are these guys always yelling at each other? But there is a very fundamental divide, and it has just to do with this. And that is, and I want you to discuss this, there are two points of view. One point of view, more conservative point of view, says, okay, listen, I wish everybody well, but my main obligation is to take care of my own family. I'm working hard. I want to make sure my kids can go to college. I want to make sure my family eats well. That's my business. And I don't want to worry about your family. And there's another view that says, well, you know, maybe as a nation we are a big family, and for a variety of reasons, all people are entitled to human rights, like the right not to go hungry, hungry, or the right to have health care, or the right to have a good education. Okay? Those are the divides. All right, I want, in this state, this is a more liberal state than most, but I want somebody to start off with a more conservative point of view. Defend the conservative point of view. Defend the position that says, I work hard. I'm worried about my family. I wish everybody well, but I don't want to make sure that other kids and I don't want to pay taxes for other kids to go to college. I've got to worry about my own kid going to college. Give me an answer to that. Defend that. Well, give me an answer to that. Anyone want to pick up on that point of view? Jackson? Hold the mic close to your face. Um, first of all, we live in a capitalist society where each person is in charge of their own needs. Good. And when I think about it, that's kind of how democracy works when you have people from all different walks of life, races, genders, all of that, uh, it works by each individual person uh, kind of putting forth, this is what I need from society. And then we do what is best for everyone, or at least try to. Good. Okay, other thoughts on this? Let me rephrase the question, for example, in terms of healthcare. Why should we worry about healthcare for all rather than just worrying about health care for our families. What's the argument there? Samantha, you want to take a shot at that one? Well, I think because um, we should be worried about that because um, we have all these different things in our society that is affecting, like, again, for, like, the hunger. Like, if children are going hungry, then it affects their health and that can be like your neighbor or that can be a family member. So I think it's really important that people, healthcare is easy, easily accessed to everybody and it's fair to everybody because then, because no one, like no one asked to get a sickness, no one asked to be sick or any of that. So, yeah. Okay. Now, an issue that you guys have not gone into, really, in your essays, is why not? Sam, you write about the need for 
you know, children to be well fed and not go hungry. Yeah, so why aren't we doing it? Now, we have done it to some degree in recent legislation, which I, among other people, played an active role in. But why isn't that permanent? Why as a nation are we even talking about children going hungry? What's the reason for that? I think the main reason is because um, the people, the children, uh, the people like us who are most affected by it, how are we going to have a say in it? We're not the ones um, with the choice to um, vote for this kind of legislation. Mm -hmm. We do have a great voice, um, which everyone can see here today, mm -hmm. but um, we don't have the direct uh, right or the direct um, ability to um, vote for this kind, these kinds of things. Okay, what I want to get at here, and I want you to think about it, and that's something you don't learn a lot about in school, I think, or see on TV too often. There are reasons why. It's not because people are stupid or members of the Congress are particularly you know, selfish. There are reasons why things happen and they don't happen. Why, for example, are we the only major country on Earth not to guarantee health care for all? Is it just something nobody has thought of? Oh, gee, that's a good idea. Too bad I didn't think of it. Why? very expensive to do so and um, we are people don't want to impose huge taxes on their constituents which will cause them a loss in um, elections I think um, members of Congress can be scared uh, to pass a really big spending bill and have um, constituents upset about spending taxes on something that doesn't directly impact them no corporations who are lobbying Congress who would not benefit from universal health care? Well, question of not benefiting, what would, what would happen to them? What is the nature of the health care system right now? It's private. Mostly private, not all. Who knows about the health care system? Is Medicare, Medicaid private or public? Uh, yeah, it's public. It's public. Most people who have health care on their job, have it through private insurance companies like Blue Cross Blue Shield, United, or other major insurance companies. Anybody know how much money the insurance companies made last year? Many, many billions of dollars of actually businesses, very, very good. What about the cost of prescription drugs? Anyone have any thoughts on that? Keeps what? Okay. Do you think everybody can afford prescription drugs in America? I think it's rare that someone can afford prescription drugs in America. Well, about one out of four people get their prescription and can't afford to fill it. Why is that? Why do we have such high prices? They're private companies and they can raise them how they want. All right. See, what I'm trying to get you guys to think about, which is not on TV very often, is to understand the forces in society which create what exists. All right. So if we ha pay, in some cases, 10 times more for insulin, which I don't know if anybody here is diabetic, but insulin is a very widely used drug in America. It's very expensive here. And I, I made a trip a couple of years ago to Canada with some folks from the Midwest, as it were. We bought the same exact insulin product for one-tenth the prices we paid in, in that case, Detroit. How does that happen? How does it happen we're the only major country not to guarantee health care at all? Some of you guys, I suspect all of you, are thinking about going to college, right? Probably some of you, depending on the finances of your family, are worried about the cost of college. So question is, if you were in Germany now or in Finland or a number of other countries, how much does college cost? Sasha, do you know? It's free. It is. Now, I just talked to some doctors yesterday at UVM Medical Center. <clears throat> young people, they're residents, and some of them are hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Now, some of you, I don't know the financial backgrounds of your families, but I suspect some of you, when you leave school, college, or graduate school, will be deeply in debt. Meanwhile, uh, we have recently given huge tax breaks to billionaires and some of the very richest people in this country don't pay a nickel in federal taxes, not a nickel.
How does that happen? Give me some good explanations here. Uh, Anna, how does that happen? Well, I think that the rich people don't, who don't pay taxes. Could speak a little bit louder, please. Sorry. The people who don't pay taxes are very wealthy and elite, and so they have a lot of power in society, and they have a lot of connections, and with those connections, they make it so that they don't have to pay taxes. Good. Now, just to give you, I want to stay on that point, because it's a very important point, which we don't discuss terribly much. I raised the issue of prescription drugs, which is something I've personally been working on for many, many years. In the last year alone, the drug companies spent $300 million on lobbying. You know what lobbying is? All right. That means they hire very sophisticated former elected officials, leaders of the Democratic Party, Republican Party, to convince them not to do anything to lower the cost of prescription drugs. $300 million. But that is kind of chump change, given the profits that they make, because they make tens of billions of dollars in profits, so it's like a nickel or a dime. All right? Talk about that, and then take that issue to the broader issue of elections. How does money impact elections? Now, Sasha says that we should ease up, uh, and we should make it easier for people to vote. And in Vermont, by the way, in recent years, we have come a long way. It wasn't always that easy. Uh, but Vermont has come a long way, and we have virtually no voter fraud. I'm not aware of any voter fraud, as a matter of fact, and yet we make it easier for people uh, to vote. But what about elections? You guys want to run for president of the United States? You want to run for the U.S. Senate? Where do you get your money? And what impact does that have on everything that we're talking about? Eva, do you want to say a word on that? Yeah, after the, the ruling of Citizens United, which allowed super PACs to form, and put so much money into politics. It's so hard to run a campaign without a lot of money from donors who are also able to really influence through lobbying the issues that get um, addressed. And okay, good. Uh, more discussion on is it if we talk about democracy, and Sasha again wants everybody to right to vote, so let's assume that happens, okay? We have very liberal voting laws, we encourage people to vote, we make it easier for people to vote, but if I run against you, Sasha, and I have you know, 20 times more money than you do, you think you're gonna beat me? No, I'm not. You're not, you're not because I will have ads on television from morning to night and hire all kinds of people. So what do we do about that? So you're interested in democracy, right? All right, is this a part of the discussion about democracy? Oh, yeah. All right, well, tell me what we're going to do about it. I think Eva had some good ideas. What do you got? Sure. Okay. The issue is money and politics. All right, who has some ideas? Samantha, you got ideas on it? Give me some solutions here. How do we prevent certain people from buying elections? amount of money that corporations are allowed to donate? Well, corporations themselves are right now not allowed to donate, but they get around that by doing it, as Eva said, through a super PAC. And um, what a super PAC is about is uh, basically a wide open secretive process that somebody can put $100 million into without getting his or her name known. And that money is is supposed to be independent. It goes to a PAC, which is supposed to be independent of the candidate, but that really doesn't mean anything because they'll be running ads for the candidate or, or doing what they want. Um, what is the antidote to that? All right, putting limits is one thing, and there was some effort. That's what Citizens United basically overturned. Are you guys familiar with the Citizens United Supreme Court decision? That's a very big deal. Um, and it was a very destructive Supreme Court decision, in my opinion. Um, but what are some states doing as an alternative, trying to get around that in the right way? Anyone have any thoughts? 
Well, what some states are trying to do is move toward public funding of elections. So in Maine, for example, and to vary New York City, for example, you can, uh, if you can uh, receive a certain number, a large number of small grants to show that small contributions to show that you have a certain level of support, then public funding kicks in. So your campaign, there'll be a limit on what you can spend, but you can run a strong campaign. In, in Maine, I think they do that fairly successfully. So that's one of the uh, antidotes uh, to that. All right, if I were to do a poll in the state of Vermont today, and I would say to the people of Vermont, what are the major issues that you are concerned about? What do you think the answer would be? The war in Ukraine. It would be an issue, not the major issue, I don't think. It would be, certainly in the last month, we've all seen that horrible war. It would be on people's minds, but probably not the main issue. Um, let's see. Uh, Jocelyn, what do you think the major issue would be? That American citizens are concerned with? People in Vermont? America. Taxes? Mm, not per se, no, I don't think so. But in general, what would the issue be? The taxes are part of it, but the broader issue, what would it be? Eva, you got any thoughts? The economy is yeah, general. That's exactly right. right. Why? Uh, people need to pay their bills and pay uh, their heat and pay their water and get right. gas for their cars. Uh, that's right. Okay, now we're talking. All right. Is that an issue? Everybody in Vermont have all kinds of money, you don't have to worry about things like paying the water bill, the electric bill, or paying for their little phones. Everybody doing just great? What's the story? Jackson, everybody doing great? You do? Oh, okay. People agree with Jackson? Everybody in Vermont doing just great? Um, Sasha, everybody doing great? From what I know, I wouldn't say so. I think that there's a lot of people struggling. Now, what happens if I told you that nationally, and I don't know how different it is in Vermont. I don't know that it's radically different. Nationally, half of the people in this country live what we call paycheck to paycheck. And I grew up in a family that lived paycheck to paycheck. What does that mean? Uh, Isabel, what does living paycheck to paycheck mean? It means that you have to spare your money as much as possible because you don't have the privilege of spending money whenever you want to. And if you don't have, say, you miss one paycheck, you lose your ability to pay all of your bills, to support your families, to support yourselves, etc. That's right. Um, it means that if your kid gets sick and ends up in the hospital, you're probably gonna go into debt, have to borrow money at very high interest rates in order to pay the medical bill. That's what it means. That is half the people in America. Why don't we talk about that more often? Half the people are living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck and, and what we have seen during the pandemic. What have we seen during the pandemic which kind of makes that issue even more clear, more apparent. Sam? Uh, what? During the pandemic, um, the most rich people in our country have only gotten more wealthy. And I think that in a broader sense, what you're talking about um, is there's those people who are living paycheck to paycheck, although there's a great number of them um, because of that they aren't the people who have the most power in our country. All right. What has the pandemic kind of made even clearer than was previously seen? Eva? Social inequities. In what sense? Um, that uh, with unemployment from due to the pandemic or um, loss of childcare, the people hardest hit have been the lowest income. We're widening the gap. What is even more dramatic? What's taken place during the pandemic? Even more dramatically. The answer is 
that many, 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 many thousands of people have died. Why did they die? Because they had to go to work in a grocery store or drive a bus or maybe be a nurse in a hospital and they contracted COVID. But if you can sit home in your computer with your computer and do your work at home, the likelihood that you get COVID is less. You can get it, everybody gets, I mean, every group of people gets COVID, but uh, by definition, when you're out with large numbers of people, as many workers are, it is more likely that you'll get it. And in fact, tens of thousands of workers have died precisely because they have to go to work. They don't have that choice. Okay. So why don't we talk about that more often? Sam, why don't we talk about that issue more often? Uh. Why didn't anybody write an essay saying, my God, thousands of people died because they were forced to go to work because if they didn't go to work, they wouldn't be able to feed their families. Because um, everyone in the country really relies on those people. No, it's not my question. No. Is that an issue? If I say to you, Sasha, you got a choice. Your family can go hungry, you go to work and you may get sick. How's that for a choice? Only one option, I think. Right. Okay, many people had to do that. But what I'm getting at is there are issues that we are comfortable about talking about, which is acceptable, issues that we're not so comfortable about talking about. And why is that? Who knows about income and wealth inequality? Is that an issue? Anyone know anything about it? Sammy knows something about it? What am I talking about when I talk about income and wealth inequality? Um, about the uh, economic gap in the country? Yeah, tell me about it. Um, about how, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact no, percentages, okay. but the top 1% uh, wealthiest people in our country control um, the majority of Okay, the, good, the <laughs> good. Well, who else wants to jump in on that issue? Penelope, you know anything about it? Um, like, the people who are most affected by this are the ones who you're least likely to hear from in politics, in the media, in whatever. So, um, you really, you have to work harder to uh, like see these inequalities, even if they're so evident in such a large percentage of the population. Okay. Jackson, thoughts on income and wealth inequality? Um, I don't really know too much about that, okay. so I'm going to pass. Okay, fair enough. All right, well, my concern is that a lot of people don't know, as, as Jackson just said. But if I were to tell you, now, you, when you watch the television and you hear about the terrible war that's taking place in Ukraine, and it is a horror. It is literally unspeakable. Very often we talk about Russian oligarchs. Have you heard that expression? What does that mean, Russian oligarchs? Who wants, anyone know anything about that? What does that mean? The top few wealthiest, most influential uh, officials and people in Russia. Right, what it is, what it speaks to is that in Russia, you have, well, without going into great discussion, you have something like a kleptocracy, which is a nation which the people on top have simply stolen a lot of the, the natural resources of, of the people after the breakup of the Soviet Union. See, a lot of crooked, you know, it's like a mafia running the country. And Putin is a part of that. And they're incredibly wealthy, Putin himself, is thought to be maybe the wealthiest person in the world, but we don't know that. Um, is there an American oligarchy? Who has thoughts on that? Either you think, what do you think? Yes, I think there are some um, families and people in America who control so much of um, the money, the heads of the pharmaceutical companies and other extremely wealthy bureaucrats. If I were to tell you that two families in America own more wealth than the bottom 40% of the American people, it's about 130 million 
versus two. Would that shock you? A little bit. Sure. That's the reality. Is that an issue of importance? Why is it that we don't discuss it much? Jocelyn? Um, I think there's a stigma around it. Um, I think it makes people uncomfortable to talk about. Um, and uh, kind of going back to what everyone was talking about with uh, the wealthiest people having the most power in our country, um, it, it, it makes it harder for the people who are actually affected to have a say in things that are happening. Okay, um, you guys have done great. Uh, do you have any questions you want to ask me? Don't be shy. Sasha, you got any questions for me? Captain Ravani. Okay, Jocelyn. Um, you know when the Senate is voting on the Women's Health Protection Act? I should know, I don't know, but it has been Discussed. Now, what that will be about is simply the codification of Roe versus Wade, and we'll lose. We'll have no Republican support, and several Democrats will vote against it. But it's a vote that should be cast. It's a, for all the reasons that we've heard today, it's a very important vote. Other questions for me? Isabel? If you had to name your first topic of concern at the moment, what would that be? Well, you can't do one, because <laughs> there are so many. Uh, for example, I know uh, uh, people who've written essays have written about climate change, and if we don't get a handle on that, I worry very much that the planet that will uh, be in existence when you guys have kids will be increasingly unhealthy and uninhabitable. And, you know, God knows what the planet looks like 100 years from now. So that's obviously a huge issue. The issue that we have discussed that uh, Sasha wrote about, whether or not you're a democratic society all over the world, uh, there has been a movement uh, toward authoritarianism. And that's what Trump represents in this country, um, where people have so much given up on government. Government does not do a particularly good job in responding to the needs of people. And people say, well, I'm tired of seeing all these jerks on television. They don't do anything. What we need is some strong guy who will make things happen. And they decide, usually what you do is divide people up and the strong guy goes after minorities and people of color or people who were born in another country and would support doing that. So that worries me. Uh, what worries me is the issue of power. and. Um, the fact that so many people are hurting, but they are powerless. No one listens to them, the media doesn't report about them, government doesn't respond to their needs. But if you try to tell the drug companies to lower their prices, they will spend many hundreds of millions of dollars in an effective way knowing how to fight back. If you say to the richest guy in the country to stop paying his fair share of taxes, he knows how to fight back and prevent that from happening. So that ties into an economy that works very well for the people on top, not so well for you know, farmers in Vermont who are losing their farms, workers who are making you know, 10, 15, 20 bucks an hour. It's hard to survive on that. So those are, um, you know, uh, and then obviously with what's happening in Russia now, um, you know, we worry about international stability and uh, whether or not we can prevent a nuclear war or a third world war and you know, alleviate the types of terrible suffering that's taking place not only in Ukraine now, but in uh, countries all over the world. So the question is, can you bring the world together to deal with things like the pandemic? The difficulty that you have now with issues like climate and the pandemic, these are global issues. If the United States government did everything right tomorrow in terms of uh, COVID, in terms of climate, wouldn't solve the problem. It has to be done globally. It's kind of hard to be do, doing, do these things globally if you're in the middle of a Cold War where there's not cooperation among the major countries. So I, I worry about that now. Have I gotten you sufficiently pessimistic? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, other questions for me? 
So what is your plans and your hopes for combating the opioid crisis? You, and thank you for raising that issue, Samantha. It is a very big issue in Vermont. It's a very big issue in many states in the country. Um, all right, I want to, I have my thoughts, but I want to throw it back to you and to other people. This issue of addiction that you touched on, that you were honest enough and strong enough to talk about your own family. Addiction is a incredibly difficult problem, and I think you raised that issue. Nobody wants to be separated from their children. Nobody wants to uh, be as desperate as people who are addicted are, and it's certainly opioids, alcohol is an addiction, cigarettes are an addiction, some people are incredibly obese, so they can't stop eating, that's an addiction. Um, let's talk, I, I'll, I'm going to do my best to answer your question, but I want to throw it open. Uh, what are some of the causes, do you think, of addiction? And this is deep stuff. And by the way, nobody has the answer. You don't have the answer, I don't have the answer. Nobody does. But even, amazingly enough, even before COVID, which has lowered life expectancy in the country, because you know so many people have died, we were seeing a decline in certain parts of the country uh, of life expectancy because of opioids, overdoses, because of alcoholism, because of suicides. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to do my best to answer Samantha's very good question, but I want to throw it out to you, Anna. Why are we seeing so many people turning to drugs, uh, getting hooked on drugs, hooked on alcohol, uh, and, and into addictive, destructive behavior? I think that part of it. Right, I, I, oh. Let me get to you, Sam, but Anna, then Sam. I think that mental health has a major impact in addiction. People can't get the help they need, and they turn to drugs and alcohol and food to make them feel better and then it turns into an addiction because it does make them feel better in the moment but in the long run good very good okay sam that's exactly what i was going to say <laughs> i was going to say that mental health is a big part of it and um a lot of the um the most addictive and the most dangerous drugs uh, that exist are over manufactured and over prescribed good. that's right that's right uh, there are studies out there that in certain, West Virginia has been hit very hard. And there are small, tiny little towns where zillions of pills were coming into the town and the drug companies certainly knew what was going on and addiction was good business for them actually. Um, and God knows how many hundreds of thousands of Americans died as, as a result. Um, I did a town hall meeting uh, maybe two years ago in Burlington High School with the kids. And it gets to a point that Anna wrote about, um, which is not unrelated to this whole issue, and that is the issue of loneliness, isolation. Anna, how does that relate to, uh, do you think, addiction? Do you think some young people might turn to drugs as a result? I do. I think that um, with COVID and quarantining and isolation, people don't have anyone to talk to, and so they don't really feel like themselves and so they turn to drugs instead of like friends. Um, I'm gonna get it back to Samantha who raised the issue, but um, uh, Sashi, thoughts on this? I think that a lot, of, a lot of the issue with addiction could also be tied to, to low income communities especially, and then that can also be connected to mental health declining mental health, and also it affects BIPOC communities especially. And I think that, I know that Samantha raised in her essay, there's a lot, there's a lack of resources for people who struggle with these, so it makes it harder for people to get out of these addictions too. Okay, um, let me try to answer Samantha's question. Um, historically, uh, what we have done in this country, I don't, can't, can't speak to what goes on in other countries. But we have said is if you break your leg, if you have cancer, you have a healthcare issue and you're gonna be covered, right? 
But if you're struggling emotionally, well, that's something else. That's not quite an illness. What do you think about that? Should we be separating mental illness from physical illness? Eva? we as a society must address mental health and mental illness just as we address physical illness in order to so mental it. illness should be considered an illness like cancer yes or? you don't have a control over that okay good um thoughts on uh, people agree should mental illness be considered as a general illness to be dealt with like cancer or broken leg or something okay can have just as a detrimental effect as any physical illness. And in fact, men a lot of mental illnesses also have very physical effects. And it they can mental illnesses can profoundly affect people's lives to the point where not only does it like hinder their ability to function, but it also, you know, like addiction, it makes them vulnerable to more dangers that can also lead to putting their lives in danger. All right, so Samantha, I'm going to tell you what I think in general, and then I'm going to throw it back to you and you help me out here. Uh, A, of course, I think that uh, mental health issues should be considered as part of health issues. And I think that health care should be universal, and in fact, is in many other countries free. Uh, that health care is a right, and that people should feel comfortable about getting the help they need and be able to get the help they need regardless of their income, all right? That exists in some countries. It certainly does not exist in this country. Um, and right now, whether it's mental illness or a physical illness, there are many, if you go to a doctor, you go to your doctor and he or she will tell you that there are patients who come in very, very sick and, and the doctor says, well, why didn't you come in You know, five months ago when you first felt your symptoms? They say, well, you know, it's a very high copayment or deductible, and I couldn't afford it. And some of those people die. Now, in terms of mental illness, as a nation, we um, don't by any means now, and I don't think this, and I should tell you that we are now putting billions and billions of dollars into uh, mental health care. But right now, we are not uh, prepared. We don't have enough counselors, we don't have enough psychiatrists. In this state, we lack child psychiatrists in a very bad way. Uh, right now, it, to give you an example of how crazy the situation is, um, if you are in Burlington and you go to the largest hospital in the state, which is UVM Medical Center, my guess is that right now they probably have 10, 20 people in beds in that hospital who should not be there. They are mentally ill, and that is not a psychiatric institute. But that is the only place they can get any treatment at all. So what they probably get is drugs to try to deal with some, calm them down. Because we don't even have in this state, I know in the Brattleboro, there's the Brattleboro Retreat, which has been struggling for various reasons. So bottom line is we don't have the resources, and we do better, I should tell you, in Vermont than most states. But even in Vermont, we are not doing the kind of job, and I think few would deny it, uh, to provide the counseling and, it, and services that people need. Now, Samantha, if you want, as I know this has been very personal to you, say a few words about addiction. Uh, addiction is a very, very difficult issue and to get rid of. It's like, it's very hard. Why don't you say a few words, you know, based on your own personal experience? I think that addiction is something that needs to be really focused on and acknowledged. Um, you know, I think kind of going back to like that first question of how does addiction, you know, develop? Um, I think that it definitely comes from, you know, past trauma, how you were brought up. Um, if you've had a line of people in your family, like if you have parents that um, were addicts, um, you know, I think that definitely has a big effect, you know, if you live in a very, in poverty and in an area where there's maybe high crime or there's not a lot of resources, a lot of people do turn to those, to addiction because it will heal what they're 
they're not able to seek. Um, yeah, it's having a personal experience. This it's um, it's been really hard. It, it's hard, um, but also that's why I'm so passionate about this topic because I'm able to. I want to help those who are struggling, and I want to be able to really provide like support to them and like understand because you know I get it and it's hard. Um. I mean, it seems to me uh, that we're looking at a two-pronged approach. Number one is, most importantly, trying to prevent people from becoming addicted, all right? And it's not really good enough to say, don't do drugs. Well, that's what I think, don't do drugs, and I hope you don't. But there are reasons why people do it, and we gotta understand those reasons, and I think it's, people are in a lot of pain, and I think it was, I don't know, Samantha Rana made the point that you can get a quick high. So if you're in a lot of pain and suddenly you take something and you're really no longer in pain, you're kind of floating, pretty good, right? But you're gonna come down and you're gonna be in worse shape than when you started. So the prevention is um, to try to create a con conditions where people are not experiencing that pain. All right, it gets back to social conditions in America and it's has a lot to do with economic conditions and poverty. That's very important, but not unique. A lot of wealthy folks become addicted to alcohol or whatever they become addicted to well. So it kind of crosses class lines, but there's kind of an emptiness that people have to fill with you know, alcohol or drugs and something. So that's number one. Why is that? How do we address that? Second of all, obviously, is that people are addicted. Uh, throwing them in jail is not, and I think you made that point in your essay, is, is, is not the, the answer, in fact, uh, if I am not mistaken, and I don't think I am, uh, probably jails in America are the major place where people are getting treatment right now, which is obviously absurd. Uh, the jails are not meant to do that. So, all right, uh, anyone have any, uh, we've been going quite a while here, anyone have any thoughts, they, last thoughts they want to share? J uh, Penelope? I guess, uh, something you said earlier, connection to that, um, you said something about how Vermont is in better standing in regards to treating mental health than the rest of the country. Uh, I'd like to know, like, how do you think Vermont is doing on the issues that have been discussed here in regards to the rest of the country and then in regards to the rest of the world, maybe? Well, uh, in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> um, this sounds like meet the press here, right? <laughs> um, in terms of the rest of the world, I mean, the, the, there's the industrialized world and then there's the impoverished world. So uh, people in developing countries in Africa, Latin America, Asia, um, there are thousands of children who die every single day from hunger. That does not take place in the United States. In terms of the developing, developed world, uh, the United States is far behind. Again, this is an issue you don't, we don't talk about for certain reasons, but in terms of um, the kinds of programs that we, it's the wrong word, programs, but in terms of what we provide to people. So if I would, I gave a speech a few years ago, and I was talking about higher education and the cost of higher education. I said, in Finland, uh, higher education is free. And then some kid jumps up and he raises his hand and he says, Senator, you're wrong. And I said, oh, okay, what's the story? He says, no, I'm from Finland. They pay us to go to college. <laughs> okay. So uh, other countries do it differently. So Scandinavia in general, uh, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, uh, generally speaking for working people, have a higher standard of living than we do. So their health care is more or less free. It varies. Child care is, is free. Uh, higher education is basically free. They don't leave with student debt. Uh, and generally speaking, although it's hard to ascertain, they, they do surveys around the world, what they call happiness surveys. Now, that's a hard thing to, how do we, are you happy? Well, you know, your definition of happiness could be different than mine. But those countries end up doing quite well compared to the United States because a lot of our people are struggling economically. You're not really terribly happy if you're worried about being evicted tomorrow, right? You, or you're worried that you can't take your kid to a doctor. Um, so 
there are a number of countries that do, I think, uh, in terms of providing security to their people, in terms of healthcare, education. Uh, those countries have relatively small amounts of poverty, for example, childhood poverty, et cetera. They do better than we do. Uh, you know, other countries that we do, you know, we do better than, and there's some areas that we do pretty well. Uh, in terms of Vermont has, I think, a uh, higher, uh, we do better uh, in terms of healthcare, more of our people are insured. I know uh, COVID has wrecked havoc on education, but in general, I think our schools are considered, you know, better than, uh, than most. I think in terms of the economy, rural parts of our, Chittenden County does pretty well economically, not great, better than much of the rest of the state, rural areas, Newport, Caledonia County, Orleans County struggling. Uh, a lot of people are struggling economically in, in, in Vermont. Um, no, that's the short answer. Um, okay, well listen, I, let me conclude this by A, uh, thanking you all and your parents for being here. Uh, and, and thanking you very much for thinking about many of the serious problems. And I know we've gone over some of the very serious problems facing our country and the world. Uh, but there are solutions to these problems. I don't want you to leave here feeling, you know, that there are no solutions. There are. Uh, this country has gone through difficult times in the past. We went through a terrible civil war. We went through the Spanish, uh, pande Spanish flu pandemic in 1917. We went through World War I, World War II, went through a, a Great Depression. And this is just another tough time. But I think if we're smart and we don't start dividing our people up based on, you know, colors of skin and all that stuff, uh, I think we can pull through this thing. But to do it, we're going to need the help of your generation big time. So you're going to have to be thinking about these issues. I don't want you to be thinking about uh, people of different points of view than you do. Understand them. People who disagree with you are not necessarily evil people. You know, they have their points of view. Learn their points of view. So let me thank you all. And what we'll do now is if anyone, um, what will we do? Um, Ryan or? Uh, OK, we're going to do it out in the lobby? All right, we'll do photographs out there as well? OK. All right, what we have for you guys, um, uh, what Beth is holding, uh, are uh, framed congressional record uh, statement, your congressional record statements, we'll put them in frames, and we'll give them to you, and then we'll do a photograph as well. Okay, thank you all very much for being here.